Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, CHP and heat pumps. And uh, I've been uh, struggling with thinking about this for a number of years. Um, I guess I've never been happy with the idea that heat pumps are, are a renewable technology when they require electricity to, to run them. Um, it wasn't quite enough for me to vote against leaving uh, Europe, but the, um, the European Commission, in their wisdom, decided that heat pumps were renewable, and as a result of that, that's led to the them being included in the renewable heat incentive and so on. Um, but I've been trying to work out a way of presenting heat pumps and, and CHP um, with various diagrams. So I'm going to start by showing you a diagram which uh, is the way I see it. You may not, but this is the way I see it. Um, so here we have a heat pump uh, that's supplying a heat demand and uh, requires some electricity to, to run it, and um, it takes heat in from the, the ambient. And we have this uh, formula for it, which is the, the, the coefficient of performance, the heat supplied, divided by the electricity. If you imagine that there's also an electricity demand here and a, a grid uh, that's a group of power stations that, that's supplying this electricity demand, if you add a heat pump to that system, then clearly you need some additional fuel for the heat pump to produce this electricity. So that's all quite straightforward. Um, I've then put uh, CHP on the same diagram. And basically, the CHP in this case um, supplies a heat demand and it also generates some electricity. Um, there are some losses, which I should have shown on the diagram there. Apologies for that. Um, if you take, if you assume that fuel going into the power station is the same as the fuel going into the CHP, then what we're really saying here is the, the electricity for the CHP is not able to meet the, this electricity demand that you would have done from the grid, because when you generate heat, you're going to be a bit less efficient than you are <coughs> at a grid power station. Uh, in, in principle, because you're generating heat at a higher temperature, so the Carnot efficiency will be less, and you will never quite make that E0. So you need some additional electricity to be made up there, and that additional electricity requires some additional fuel. So if you look at this diagram, the CHP is producing some heat um, because it's sacrificed some electricity generation up there. <coughs> so you can call the CHP very like a heat pump and say it's meeting a heat demand um, and the, the effectively the extra electricity that's required to be generated is this, this figure here. So if you just look at those, that diagram, you can see it's um, the CHP and the heat pump are virtually the same technology. They're sort of two sides of the same coin. If you want to make this a bit easier to understand, if you divide these, the top and bottom of this equation by this fuel going in, you get this formula for the equivalent COP of... Uh, um, CHP, the CHP heat efficiency divided by the difference between the grid and the CHP efficiency. Um, so if you want to put numbers to that, if you said the CHP heat efficiency is 45%, the electrical efficiency 35 and the grid 45, then you can see you get 45 over 10. So the COP is 4.5. So perhaps a little better than, than the heat pump. If, however, the grid efficiency goes up to <coughs> 50%, and this is 45 and 35 again, then the COP is 3. Um, so equivalent to my, uh, a good heat pump. Um, so what I'm saying from this really is that in both cases, CHP and heat pumps 
uh, require some additional fuel. And they're broadly similar technologies. And really the only difference is that the heat pump benefits from regulation and has had lots of money thrown at it with no thermodynamic justification. <laughs> However, it gets more complicated um, than this because I've assumed here there's just one fuel in the system and obviously it's more complicated than that. Um, this is the graph that uh, is quite useful to compare any technology, it seems to me. When we're trying to produce heat, we want to know what the CO2 content of the heat is. And um, I've put some lines there. So the, the, the gas boiler, um, uh, this is plotted against electricity emission factor. Obviously, the gas boiler is somewhere up here, and it's irrelevant what the electricity is. But these other sources um, depend on the electricity emission factor. So if you just have straight electric heating, then that's obviously um, the same as the electricity emission factor. If you have a heat pump with a COP of 3, you're on this line, and a reasonably efficient CHP is on this line. And uh, extraction from a power station, whether it's gas or nuclear or um, biomass or waste, would, would, would be on this line because you lose very little electricity when you extract heat from a, a steam turbine. So this enables us to compare um, different sources on a common basis. Now, as, as you know, at the moment, we've got an electricity emission factor of around 500, and so the CHP is looking, looking pretty good. Um, over time, we're expecting the electricity emission factor to reduce, and so the CHP will get worse, and the heat pump will get, uh, will get progressively better. So the question is really, what is the electricity emission factor? Uh, if we're going to use that graph, we need to know what, what the definition is that we, we're putting in. And there are actually a number of different definitions. So you could take the current grid annual average. Um, so that's the easiest thing to do. Um, but it's of limited use, really, particularly if you're looking at investments that are going to operate over the next 15 years. You could take the average grid factor for the next three years, which I believe is the basis on which the building regulations are written. Um, doesn't seem to be much justification for just using three years if you're aiming to influence uh, investments that will last much longer than that. The problem with using the average grid factor is that what effectively you're assuming then is that when the CHP is operating, it's displacing all the, all the sources on the grid equally. So when, when you're running your, your CHP, um, when you turn it on, the assumption is that some wind turbines and some nuclear power stations actually reduce their output, which clearly doesn't make sense. <coughs> so another option is to use the operating marginal emissions factor. So this is looking at what's happening on the grid, what plant would turn off when you run the CHP. That's very good for determining in the short term what your uh, CHP is actually doing. So if, if you're at the Warwick campus here, I don't think it should be the case that you turn off your CHP when the average emission factor gets below a certain point. We should be looking more around the operation. But there's another definition which is around the build marginal emissions factor. So this is more saying if you've got a lot of plant that's going to be built on the system in the future, you need to look not so much as to what the CHP is displacing when it's operating, but what that capacity is, and this doesn't just apply for CHP, any, any power stations, what that capacity is that it's displacing that would have been built if you, bu if you built your, your plant. So that's called the build marginal emissions factor. Now, it's particularly important where a system is expanding, uh, or rather, new plant is, is being added to it. <coughs> um, now, in the um, United Nations uh, 
clean development, me clean development mechanism, is that right? Um, they uh, wrestled with this, and there's a paper from the UNFCCC which says uh, what you should actually do is use a weighted average of the operating and build marginal factor, depending on whether it's the operational aspects which is really important or the build. And in the absence of knowing quite what the future holds, a 50-50 average would be sensible. But again, do you do that on a one-year on a one-year basis or on a uh, forward look basis? So um, the report I was involved in, which I was staggered to see, was 2010, um, produced for the Zero Carbon Hub. Actually, came up with a 15-year forward prediction of the 50-50 average of operating and build marginal factor as a way. So this was a recommendation as to how building regs should should tackle this issue. Um, so this is a graph taken from that report. Um, at the time, we were looking at, uh, so we just take this one, the operating marginal would be coal-fired plant up to a certain point, and then it would drop to gas plant. Okay, The build marginal would be gas plant until basically we stopped building gases, gas CCGT and built only nuclear and renewables. And um, if you take the 50-50 average of that, you get this line. And if you take the rolling average over 15 years, you, you get this line. That uh, methodology seems to have some, some merit to it in reflecting the various aspects. If we then um, take the point from our from our graph earlier, we had a point around a bit less than 300 here where, where CHP doesn't make any sense. Um, if we take that forward, then we end up with something around 2022 as being uh, a point at which uh, new investment in CHP may not be worthwhile because it wouldn't save carbon. But that doesn't mean that in 2023 we turn all the CHPs off because that would probably increase emissions. So I would say maybe there's a case for having systems with CHP and heat pumps. Uh, if you're at um, gas CCGT on the right here, CHP makes sense. If you're in renewables um, on the left, then a heat pump makes sense. I actually think there isn't anything in the middle there, and it's pretty pointless talking about emission factors in the middle when you're looking at operating plant. What actually is going to happen, projecting forward to 2035, is that you'll have some type periods where there is surplus wind on the system and um, very low CO2 electricity and other times when the marginal plant is gas. Um, the green here is representing the gas plant. So perhaps a system that has both CHP and heat pumps that operate at different times together with thermal storage uh, would actually give you the best of both worlds. Obviously, to do that, you need some good um, modelling to work out on an hourly, hour by hour basis over the next 20 years what might or might not happen. Um, and that's a little lead in to our next speaker. Thank you. <coughs>